Welcome back to the meeting of the Standing Senate Committee on Aboriginal Peoples. We are continuing our work on the pre-study of Bill C-92. The committee is pleased to welcome this afternoon uh, Professor pa Pamela Palmiter, Associate Professor and Chair in Indigenous Governance, Ryerson University, Hadley Friedland, Assistant Professor, Faculty of Law, University of Alberta, and Naomi Metallic, Professor and Chancellor's Chair in Aboriginal Law and Policy, Dalhousie University. We will begin with opening remarks from Ms. Palmiter to be followed by Ms. Friedland and Ms. Metallic. I should say professors. Professor, Professor. <laughs> <laughs> professor Palmiter, you have the floor. Um, I'm from the sovereign Mi'kmaq Nation on unceded Mi'kmaq territory, and it's a privilege to be here on unceded Algonquin territory today. Uh, by way of background, I've been a practicing lawyer for 20 years, 10 of which was spent at Justice Canada, and I've completed all of their training in the legislative process, legislative drafting, and statutory interpretation. My doctorate focused specifically on legislation impacting Indigenous peoples, and that's my core area of expertise today. Um, I'm here to speak against Bill C-92 as it is currently drafted. It needs substantive and substantial amendments if it is going to be considered uh, a bill uh, worthy of First Nations. My primary concerns are that the bill does not do anything that the AFN, the Assembly of First Nations, or Indian Affairs however it styles itself today, um, promised that it would do. Um, it promised that it would address the humanitarian crisis, and there is nothing in this bill that will do that. My first concern is that it is pan-Aboriginal legislation that specifically discriminates against First Nations because it does not focus on First Nations-specific rights, unique histories, socioeconomic conditions, or their specific interests. And First Nations should not be limited by the very different legal, political, and social status of other groups. For example, the Métis as a collective do not suffer the same degree or severity of socioeconomic conditions that First Nations and Inuit do. And we all know that in the law, when you make all groups formally equal, you deny substantive equality to the most oppressed groups. And while this is not a race to the bottom, we're talking about very significant differences in the rights and needs of these groups. And that's why Canadian courts have specifically rejected formal equality as between groups and focuses now on substantive equality. And that is not in this bill. First Nations will be discriminated in this legislation and denied their basic rights to substantive equality. My second concern is that there is no independent recognition or status for First Nation laws. They are considered to be, if accepted, a federal law, not unlike a bylaw under the Indian Act. And for anyone who's ever worked for First Nations, it is almost impossible to get the RCMP or even a court to uphold a bylaw, despite the fact that it is a so-called federal law. The other thing is that First Nations laws, if recognized, would be conditional or subjected to the Charter, the Canadian Human Rights Act, Section 35 of the Constitution Act, and all of the very limited interpretations from those court cases, the division of powers between federal and provincial governments, coordination agreements, and all of the interpretations of those court, uh, coordination agreements by courts or the failure to abide by those uh, coordination agreements by provinces, pre-existing definitions of best interests of the child, court-defined and open to interpretation, and any level of discretion uh, or interpretation by others is where racism and abuse is allowed to enter, and that is the problem with the current system. Sections 10 to 15 of the bill uh, itself is a limit on First Nation powers. So you have no less than seven fundamental and substantive conditions on First Nation powers. It makes you wonder, well, where is the power? And there isn't any power. Um, the paramountcy of laws between federal, provincial, and First Nations are very unclear in this bill. To ask First Nations to rely on the non-derogation clauses in the Charter or the Canadian Human Rights Act is exceptionally risky 
because it is determined by the federal uh, by the courts themselves, and they are pri basically untested. It's uncharted territory. We don't know where they would land, and we have big concerns around the notwithstanding clause and um, taking exception to any rights that First Nations might have. My third uh, concern is that First Nations, um, it forces First Nations to negotiate coordination agreements with federal and provincial governments when provinces are the problem. This is the problem. The provinces literally having anything to do with our kids or why they go murdered and missing, why they end up in jail, why they're trafficked, why they're abused in their homes, why we have this crisis. And you can tell by the resistance of the provinces to this bill that they've made very public statements about that they are not willing to let go of either the power or the funding associated with our kids. They've very much built up an industry around our kids and I don't see them letting that go anytime soon. They haven't acknowledged their part of the process. My fourth concern is that there is no statutory guarantee of funding. Recognizing a call for funding by First Nations is not a statutory guarantee of funding. It only references that call. There's no guidelines for funding that it must be based on population, inflation, actual costs, actual needs, or the rights of First Nations. There's no mandatory provision around Jordan's principle. There's no guidelines around what constitutes prevention funding. And there's no commitment to, under, to address the underlying root causes of the apprehensions to begin with, which might not be seen as child and family services, like housing, food, water, clothing, access to mental health services, which are all the fundamental root causes. My, other, my fifth concern is that the minister retains all of the powers under the Act, um, including the regulations, be, simply having to consult with First Nations is how we're actually in this really problematic relationship to begin with. Consultation alone is not working. You need an actual recognition of First Nation power to make their own decisions. Questions around uh, best interest of the child, who makes that determination? Coordination agreements, whether or not they you've negotiated enough who makes that? Whether or not there's a conflict with treaties, who makes these determinations? And global pan-Indigenous consultations skews any input that the minister might get on things like regulations to issues that are completely irrelevant to First Nations. What is good for the Métis is not good for First Nations and vice versa. We shouldn't be speaking about what should happen with the Métis. By empowering the minister with new powers, and we don't even know what minister, it could be the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans for all we know, um, it skews everything such that you're disempowering First Nations, because whatever power you give to a minister, you necessarily take away from a First Nation. Um, and there's no specific provision against the forced or coerced sterilization of Indigenous women and girls used in the context of child and family services, which we all know is a problem. This bill doesn't have a gender-based lens. It doesn't put women's voices first. It doesn't put their experiences first because it's the mamas primarily who are losing their children to child apprehension or being forced uh, to have sterilization. Um, there's lots of other issues. The wording is confusing and vague and unclear. There's no directive to have maximum contact and take active efforts where they would be accountable back to First Nations. There's issues around privacy that would detract from current legislation that exists in other provinces and hamper First Nations' ability to advocate for their First Nations. Um, nothing about jurisdiction for off-reserve First Nations people and how that would be resolved. And so my suggested amendments very quickly is that this be specific First Nation legislation only when there's free prior and informed consent with a very detailed opt-out clause that has funded optional alternatives. So if a First Nation is already engaged in managing their own child and family services, that should be a funded alternative to being forced into this legislation. There should be targeted and committed funding specifically for First Nations, where the minister will provide necessary needs-based, population-based funding, the kind of wording you can't get around, something you can take to the bank or take to court, something that is judiciable, and there's nothing judiciable in here. The First Nation uh, inherent right to be self-determining over CFS must be recognized in their own right, 
And in order to do that, you need a consequential amendment to the Indian Act, which specifically repeals Section 88 so that provincial laws cannot apply on reserve. Um, I have a bunch of other ones. UNDRIP should be referenced. The rights of the child should be referenced. And there should be a comprehensive review of this legislation um, to make significant amendments if there is any hope of saving it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then my last question is um, for Ms. Palmet or, or Professor Palmet, sorry. Uh, one of the things that we're really challenged with is the TRC recommendations or the calls to action says that they wanted Aboriginal child welfare law and they wanted minimum standards included in that. And um, I have, you know, those are the calls to actions. I think that's what the federal government was responding to. And I hear what you're saying, that um, how do we reconcile Indigenous um, uh, jurisdiction, ability to create their own laws, but then harken back to these uh, minimum standards that the government is putting forward. And yet the TRC called for that. And I just wondered if you could mm -hmm. talk a little bit about how we reconcile that call to action that they're clearly responding to with the issues that you've brought up. Um, well, thank you for the question. Uh, and I think it's an important one because we have to remember there are lots of public inquiries, commissions, reports, updates, mm -hmm. analysis all the time. I mean, Indigenous peoples have been studied to death just because it appears as a call to an action or a recommendation okay. doesn't mean that that is the solution. So maybe 90% of the calls to action are what First Nations want, but it might not be. Okay. Uh, similarly with RCAP, RCAP had lots of great recommendations and some very problematic ones that we wouldn't want to follow. So it's, it's a, I mean, the federal government has never held itself bound by any royal commission or inquiry report ever before. So I would find it hard to believe that they feel themselves bound by the TRC. Mm -hmm. And that's with due respect, because the TRC is a very good report, very substantive. But you can still keep up with it in principle, so long as there is, um, if, if desired by First Nations, Métis and Inuit, uh, a legislative path forward that still fulfills the spirit of having legislation. It's just that there's a different reality for those group. There's no such thing as an Aboriginal group or an Aboriginal person. We're completely different. Totally. And, um, you know, just, just to also respond to your other question, I think it's important on funding that it not just be in the preamble and a principle. It has to be a substantive right that you can take to the bank. So it should appear in all three places, preamble, principle, and a separate standalone um, judiciable right. Thank you. Senator Patterson to be followed by Senator McFedrin. Thanks very much, um, Madam Chair. You know, I, I found these um, presentations very, very compelling and persuasive and um, reminded me at times of our discussions about S3 and human rights. Um, here's the situation, um, and I'm speaking as a member of the Senate. Um, there's an election in the fall. There is a very tight timetable for dealing with dozens of bills that are piling up in the Senate, including this one, and this is very important. Um, we are, Parliament is due to recess June 21st, uh, unless that changes. And uh, the Senate uh, may, may not sit much longer than that. Uh, I guess, so what I'm asking you is, um, I th you and Cindy Blackstock, um, and the Manitoba um, chiefs um, spokespersons yesterday have all talked about the need to respect the inherent jurisdiction. And they've all, you've all talked about um, this being a <clears throat> federal act that um, there, there, thereby erodes that, that jurisdiction. 
In fact, in Manitoba, there was even a an MOU um, signed a couple of years ago now that they started working on that was moving to towards reflecting the inherent jur- jurisdiction. And um, they they have participated in good faith and and made good progress. Um, the minister's folks said, well, um, if they want to go that route, they can do it on self-government. But that uh, could be a long process. Um, so, and there was also this, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just stop there. So I guess what I want to ask you is you know Ms. Blackstock and um, uh, Professor Pometer and yourselves have all suggested a real a real different approach to the 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 bill Um, but at the same time I think everyone agrees that this um, situation is in need of attention and as I understand it provinces um, as, as you described in the history uh, Professor Metallic provinces have now take taken on the jurisdiction and there's money involved and I've heard some people say actually profit that they at least they recover their costs and maybe then some so I guess what I'd like to really understand is, you know, if we recommend um, a radical, uh, n- a di- radically different approach, uh, which will um, show more respect for the inherent rights, um, it's not going to go over very well. <laughs> the... Um, the, the government feels that, the minister just told us today, if if a, a First Nations group can't, or if an Indigenous group can't work something out with the province, then after a year, they can, they can go ahead um, under the federal framework. So um, don't worry so much about, about that, they, they were saying. I guess I just want to know if if we're risking losing this bill by significantly amending it as you've recommended and as Dr. Blackstock has recommended, who of course is very well respected in this field, um, we risk losing the whole thing, I think. And I'm just wondering, um, is this a time when the Aboriginal People's Committee has to say, you know, do it right or don't do it. Like, do you, do you understand my dilemma? Um, right after this session with you, we're supposed to uh, put together a report for the Senate. And, you know, I started out thinking that there were some tweaks that, you know, uh, could be could be found, but you've suggested quite a significant, quite significant changes, all of you, and I think you're on the same ground. Um, what's your advice? You know, do we risk uh, starting a, a, a longer, more difficult process by uh, taking the route that you, you recommend and having a confrontation with, with Parliament? Um, maybe I'm asking you for political advice here, but I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of conf- I just want to confess my reaction to what what you had to say is uh, how important like is there some value in taking this small step forward with some tweaks or do we need to say no it's got to be fundamentally better to re- to recommend to respect the in- the inherent right. Um. So this is very much like Bill S-3. And in fact, and I don't know if this is political advice or not, we wouldn't have the bill as it is had the Senate not taken a strong stand and said in this country, gender equality is the law, 
and you have to do better. But we are still also left with provisions that are not enforced. So kids and families are still going without and they're not even covered by Jordan's principle because they're non-status and Canada is still fighting Cindy Blackstock in court to not pay those non-status kids. So that's just one of the ramifications of not, not just going all the way to the end to say, no, we stood strong, we're going to send it back. And I think on this bill, here's the danger. This is it. If, 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 if you accept this bill and all of the deficiencies and how it won't do any of the things that we wanted and there's no promise of funding, we're not going to get another bill. Because Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, came in on a platform of not only am I going to respect your rights, but I'm going to repeal all of the legislation that Harper imposed on you without consultation that violated your rights. Not a single one of those pieces of legislation were ever repealed and never will be. Amendments were supposed to be made to Bill C-51, the anti-terrorism legislation, never was and never will be. So if we don't get it right now, this humanitarian crisis is not only going to continue, but it's going to be like mired in this potentially 634 coordination agreements on jurisdictional disputes and vague, vague paramountcy and lawsuits. And who suffers from that? So I don't think we have the right to say on behalf of First Nation kids, you know what, let's just take anything. Let's just take anything. We should be giving them the maximum because, because the government has given them the minimum. This is why we're in this crisis. And I, and I really feel like this Senate is a different Senate. It fought for us on S3, and I think it can fight for the most vulnerable people in this country and demand more, and you have the power to actually affect that change. <coughs> they may not like it, and they may grumble about it, but because of you standing up and saying no, that'll force amendments. And, and I think that's, that's what you should be doing. Senator McFedrin, to be followed by Senator Christmas. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, my apologies for not being able to be in two places at once <laughs> since we're, we're, we're sitting. Um, and I, I also didn't know we had started earlier, so I'm, I'm sorry to have missed your presentations. Um, I want to just, this, this is not my question, but to the discussion of C-92 wording and C-91 being transported, I think it's also important, and we certainly take a note of it here, that um, the statement of principle is good in C92, but it's still optional. The language is still may. So um, in looking at this, um, I think that we want, we'll, we'll keep that in mind as well. But I, my question, um, without having had the benefit of your presentations, I wanted to ask whether you saw space within your positions for opting out. Let, looking at this hy hypothetically, it does become a bill. Um, you address that in detail, the opting out? Okay, good. Then I can go on to my next question. No, no, no. no we were nodding that we want to <laughs> Oh, <laughs> they didn't. Oh. I included oh. okay. in mine, but they didn't. So that, so that is, okay, please. Um, any thoughts or points you'd like to make about that and changes potentially that we could be considering? Professor Palmer. Yeah, and so um, I had said that there should be an opt out because not all First Nations believe in federal legislation. They're already w they already have their own laws, for example, or their own jurisdiction or processes in place. But um, the opt out clause has to be uh, a realistic opt out clause. So you know, like some of the opt out clause that former Conservative government were suggesting were just opt out. Your choice is this or the status quo. And what I'm saying is it has to be an opt out with funded alternatives mm -hmm. so that you don't you're not prejudiced by opting out because you have your own system but it's also equally funded on the same kinds of core principles mm -hmm. so that you know first nations can really be self-determining not just because the federal government recognizes it but because they're already in that process thank you and if i may um i um if you didn't address this um, please tell me if you did but i'd like to get your feedback on the wording um, further down in the bill uh, where it relates to regulations both in 32 clause 32 and um, also in clause 34 where the language um, 
it begins, each of those clauses begin with, if affected Indigenous governing bodies were afforded a meaningful opportunity to collaborate in the policy development leading to the making of regulations. Had you, had you addressed that already? I wanted to get your sense of it, its usefulness, um, any precedents that you would see being able to build upon. Um, so, so I touched on that a bit, that the, the bulk of the powers in here still rest with the minister. You know, the minister makes decisions and decides if this coordination agreement worked or not, if there's a conflict, the extent of the conflict, and also regulations, and that the only obligation here is consultations, which doesn't even um, keep up with Supreme Court of Canada language around consultation, accommodation, and potentially consent in certain circumstances, nor does it match for free prior informed consent of UNDRIP, which Canada is supposedly uh, in support of, um, and 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 this is the the heart of the problem. And I think um, recognition of First Nation jurisdiction to enact their own laws is just that. It's not. And n not only will we enact the law, but we also get to enact the regulations once we decide if there's been a meaningful opportunity, whether or not you've been funded to per to. Uh, um, have an opportunity and also that it's pan-aboriginal the fact that Métis should have no say over what happens to First Nation kids and First Nations should have no say over what happens to Inuit kids because it's all different rights and histories and contexts and Cultures. and uh, needs needs because First Nations are far more acute than Métis for example or Inuit are far more acute than Métis so there's there's a lot of problems with, and it's an undefined minister as well. It could be, like I said, the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans or the Department of National Defense. And that in itself is an insult, that that's not even noted in here. It's, it just goes to show how very, still very paternalistic it is that they decide. And, and so we have a problem, lots of problems with this regulation section. And we don't even know what would be in those regulations if they ever do do regulations. And um, would you... Um, share a concern that the way in which they're constructed is um, to make a highly litigious environment inevitable. We are here with this problem and all the crisis we have, not just in child welfare, but in housing and in water and in, in pipelines and, you know, land claims because of the problem with lack of consultation. And they get to interpret it and courts get to interpret it. And the fact that if we want to enforce this, what if they didn't consult? What are our options? Well, we'd have to rely on the most wealthiest band to be able to take that case to court. And maybe all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada in, what, five years, 10 years, 25 years? Mm -hmm. And that's, how does that help kids? Kids are losing entire lifetimes through all of this, all of this discretion, all, all of the def, you know, defects in this bill. Um, and... And like we said, I don't know if you're here about the discussion around the coordination agreements. You could potentially have 634 coordination agreements in all different provinces and territories with all of this bad wording, and it's just a massive amount of litigation. And then what about the social workers trying to make decisions about these kids? Mm -hmm. And what do they do about it? And again, it's the kids. So if we don't have clarity and directive mandatory language on everything we want, we're opening it up for litigation, and it'll be the courts that make decisions for us again, instead of recognizing First Nations self-determining rights to make these decisions for themselves. Yeah, I just wanted to add, I think statistics are important for another reason, because once um, this crisis of, of First Nation kids in foster care uh, became really popular in the media, Provinces like the province of Manitoba started manipulating their statistics. So changing how they count when a child is considered to be in care. So the same amount of kids, it's just, well, we're not going to include the ones that are in care with grandma. Or we're not going to include the ones here and there. Um, so we also have to have very specific mandatory like language around that. Um, to make sure that there can be no manipulation of the statistics, that the, all of the kids in care are noted as the kids in care so that they don't minimize the crisis at hand and, and not be accountable for those numbers. It should be that we count everyone. Oh, I'm sorry. We, we're out of time. I'm sorry. 